Hi and welcome to our Conceived Baby discussion today. Today we'll be talking about one of the most common conditions that affects female reproduction and that's endometriosis, which is a complex condition and medical treatments are limited. And this is where natural medicine really comes in because there are a lot of factors that can be successfully treated and overcome to help improve symptoms improve fertility and improve pregnancy outcomes. So today we're going to be talking about some of those factors, diagnostic tests and natural treatment strategies to help you overcome endometriosis and get pregnant. So firstly, if you haven't joined us before, my name's Tasha Jennings, founder of Conceive Baby. I'm a naturopath, nutritionist, natural fertility specialist and author of The Vitamins Guide and The Fertility Diet. And if you're already part of the Conceive Baby community, you would know I am passionate about helping women and couples fall pregnant and have happy, healthy babies. And my aim for conceivebaby.com.au is to bring together a team of specialists across all aspects of fertility and preconception health to provide you with qualified expert information to help you achieve your baby dreams. And one of those fabulous experts I'm thrilled to be speaking with today is Leia Hechtman. Leia is an experienced and respected clinician and has been in practice for over 20 years. Leia specialises in fertility, pregnancy and reproductive health care for men and women. Her primary passion is in her clinical practice, where she is inspired and humbled by her patients. Leia has completed extensive advanced training and is currently completing her PhD for the School of Women's and Children's Health Faculty of Medicine. She is a keynote speaker at major conferences across Australia and internationally. I've enjoyed listening to many of her presentations myself and an author and educator to her peers. And I know we have many naturopaths tuning in today to listen to some of Leah's amazing insights. And she's also the director of the Natural Health and Fertility Centre in Sydney and mother to two gorgeous boys. So welcome, Leia. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you today to be talking about one of the most important topics or affecting female fertility because it does affect around 30 to 50% of um, reproductive issues. Mm. So let's talk a bit about what is endometriosis? What is happening in the body when we talk about endometriosis? Look, it's a, it's a complicated condition. It, the simplest answer is obviously that we have the endometrial lining in the uterus and cells from that lining go and travel and they end up at different spots in the reproductive system, sometimes digestive organs, urinary organs, etc. And they cause considerable pain and discomfort to women. Um, unfortunately, the pain is not necessarily indicative of the severity of the disorder. So some women will have a severe condition where, you know, they have infiltration of all of these endometrial cells and they don't have equivalent pain or vice versa. They'll have a more reduced case, but they'll have extreme pain. Either way, the impact of fertility is quite profound um, and the distress and the trauma that it inflicts upon women is quite significant. Yes, and I know it can take a long time to diagnosis as well. You know, I've yes. heard that eight or nine years is the average diagnostic period. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah, I guess a lot of women aren't even aware that they have the condition until they, they go to fall pregnant. I know I you probably see a lot of patients, I, I do myself, who you say, you know, oh, just the average period pain and clots and things. And women aren't aware that these things aren't normal. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that, you know, there's just a misconception that every woman should be hugging a hot water bottle, you know, yeah. when it's her time of the month and it's actually not the case. And, you know, I think women need to be educated that something that interferes with your quality of life and means that your menstrual period interferes with your ability to achieve your normal life means that there's something wrong. Period yeah. pain is not normal. I think some of these awareness campaigns and things that aren't that are happening will hopefully um, help to infiltrate that. Yeah. What are some of the symptoms that, that you commonly see and would, would get people to have a look at? Look, the basics are, as we're saying, period pain, you know. So uh, a woman with endometriosis 
typically she'll have a lot of pain, not necessarily when she's just bleeding. You know, she might have a lot of pain in the lead up to her period. She might have a lot of pain around ovulation um, and certainly significant pain as she's bleeding. Um, she tends to have a more clotted period. She tends to have a heavier bleed, but it's not diagnostic. Um, she tends to have pain with intercourse. Sometimes she bleeds after intercourse. I tend to see a lot of women will have more frequent urinary tract infections and thrush, particularly in the lead up to their period as well. Um, but, you know, like I always say to women, sex is not meant to be painful. Yeah. If it's painful, something's not quite right. Yeah. And, you know, some of those basics where I think that women, and there's a lot of media campaigns around it at the moment, women um, unfortunately have this expectation that these things are normal and they're not. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really important message to get across. If it doesn't feel normal to you, yeah. it's worth looking into and yeah. you buy yeah. something. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, the worst is where women are told, oh, you just have period pain and IBS. There's probably a link and the IBS is probably endo. Exactly, and that's where natural medicine, I guess, is better in a way at treating endometriosis because they are very limited in medical options. Obviously, laparoscopy mm -hmm. is where the diagnosis is um, and surgery, but other than that, you know, the, the pill... But that's, that's not really, doesn't work when you're trying to fall pregnant. That's not a, a, an adequate treatment strategy. And as you said, it's involved in a lot of other things, IBS, you know, there's a lot of other systems involved, the immune system, inflammation. So let's talk a bit about that and how, I guess, we look at it holistically as, as naturopaths. Mm. Look, I mean, the way that I see endometriosis is that it's an inflammatory disorder. That certainly predominantly affects the reproductive system, but it's it's multi-system. It's right through a woman's body. So she will experience anything from having frequent migraines and headaches to having lowered immune response before she gets her period and more easily picks up an infection or obviously menstrual symptoms. She'll, she'll experience a whole host of different symptoms that are all together related to the endometriosis. All the new research shows that there's a derangement around the immune response and that there is usually a triggering infection of some description. Um, and the types of infections can be as varied as a virus or a digestive parasite or, or others. But I'm yet to see a woman with endometriosis that doesn't have some sort of other infection. And I'm yet to see a woman that doesn't present with significant infiltrating inflammatory processes right across the board. Yes. And that's something that we are, I guess, able to successfully retreat. Uh, what do you look at? What are the first things you look at with women who have endometriosis in regards to the treatment strategy? Obviously, every patient is unique, yeah, um, but obviously there's some specific things that are specific to this particular condition. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, a good case history is number one. So really getting a good understanding of her history in many areas, you know, including emotional. There's um, a number of papers that I've read, but certainly one in particular that showed that 80% of women with endometriosis had a history of trauma in particular sexual trauma. So I think it's important to identify if that is a component and refer as appropriate, support as appropriate, et cetera. And certainly to you know expand your question to talk about overseas travel, never been well since a gut bug, never been well since glandular fever when they were 12, or you know like all sorts of other intricacies in her history can elucidate and give you an informed picture as to who she is and what her picture should be. Yeah. And I know, I mean, we are talking particularly about fertility today Absolutely. and it has a big impact on fertility and obviously we can have mm -hmm. loft loping tubes, et cetera, but what are the other ways in which the endometriosis does affect fertility and pregnancy outcomes? Look, I mean, you know, her chance of implantation is affected. Yeah. There's so many different variables, you know, is it that, you know, her uterus doesn't shed itself appropriately so it becomes less hospitable for implantation for the subsequent cycle? Is it that there is so much significant inflammation and such a strong immune response that she just rejects the embryo? I don't think we have definitive answers for it, but we have theories. But certainly the endometriosis woman takes longer to conceive. She has a much greater risk of miscarriage and she certainly, you know, pregnancy doesn't fix her endo. We used to all think that it doesn't fix her endo. But the only good thing that I always tell my endo women is, is you've had terrible periods, labour's a breeze. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> they know pain, you know, like your women with endo, their, their pain thresholds are just, they're outstanding. You can't compare them to anybody else. And so they get to labour and they're like, I've had a worse period than that. So there's, there's a good part. <laughs> I know, that's what I think it's important to touch on because I think it's really sad that women are going through these extremely painful periods and having the perception that that, that is normal. And hopefully I know there's a lot of education now happening in schools and things as well, which is 
really heartening to see uh, because this is not normal. These are symptoms that we really do need to get on top of. And the sooner we can, I guess, the, the, the better the outcome for, for the patient and the woman. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, in regards to, I guess, diagnostic tests, we do lap laparoscopy as the medical, you know, standard of to find out about it. But there are a lot of other tests that we do as naturopaths that, you know, some may seem unrelated to, to get a better picture of what's going on. What are some of the diagnostic tests that you recommend? With women with suspected endometriosis, um, I still use a CA125. There is an element of controversy around it. It's technically a cancer marker, but it is a, um, a diagnostic of the level of reproductive inflammation. So it will be elevated in reproductive cancers, certain types, but also fibroids and adenomyosis and things like that. Um, I use it as a way to assess how much inflammation is in the reproductive tissue. And if I'm suspect about endo, it's certainly easier to do a CA125 by blood than it is to do a laparoscopy. So I think it's a start. Yeah. Um, I do encourage women to get a thorough ultrasound with bowel prep through a specialist women's sonography center. And, you know, in Sydney where I'm based, ultrasound, so Sydney Ultrasound for Women or Ultrasound Care are your best options and they're very, very skilled. And they can usually detect endometriosis much more effectively than your standard sonography place because um, most of those places have no idea what they're looking at because they're not specialists. So it's just what it is. Yeah. Um, but, but those two tests in conjunction with a whole host of other things, you know, as a naturopath, I certainly want to look at, you know, nutritional biochemistry, other inflammatory markers, I'm, you know, very interested in looking at things like cytokine panels, which are looking at the immune response and the possibility of an underlying infection. And it can give me clues as to where the infection might lie and where my treatment direction might head. Um, and certainly as well, you know, if you if you track estrogen levels, just plain old um, estradiol in blood, you can see that your endometriosis women generally have higher E2 levels than the average woman. And it's not to confirm that estrogen is purely um, not estrogen, sorry, endometriosis is purely an estrogen dominant condition. It's just that, you know, it's an estrogen loving condition. And so the body tends to flourish with it. Yeah. I think those two factors of you know, the inflammation and the immune system are something that we look at because the etiology of, of endometriosis is almost largely unknown in the medical community as well. Um, it's great that we have these two systems that we can support that support the, the treatment of endometriosis. Yeah. yeah. What are your natural treatment strategies? So I guess let's firstly look at the inflammation side of things, which, which does seem to blanketly affect everyone um, who has endometriosis. What are the things you look at in regards to diet, herbal support, nutritional support to support that inflammatory process? I do find that diet is probably one of the most important things that a woman can do. It's very self-empowering. It's quite simple if she's obliging, um, but it makes dramatic changes. And you know, some of the food groups that we know and we have evidence around causing aggravation of inflammation and aggravation of symptoms are certainly casing. Um, so avoidance of dairy. You know, there's the theory that you can just avoid a one milk and only have a two milk. Depends on the person. I, I do see that certainly clinically, but I find with some women, it's actually better to just avoid dairy in its entirety. Um, and, you know, with endometriosis, it's not a, oh, look, 90% of the time I'm fine. Um, I have the odd ice cream. It's not a big deal. It actually is because you're trying to retrain an inflammatory process. So absolutely strict vigilance is what's absolutely key. Um, women with endo tend to also have strong reactions to gluten. I'm not of the nature where I cut gluten out for every single endo woman. I prefer to have some blood diagnostics that confirm that there is an immune reactivity. Or something present um, but if the woman's obliging and she's happy to take it out great mm. um, I mean but you, you can certainly also look at it that a woman that takes out gluten generally has a lower grain content in her diet and grains are you know destabilizing to insulin levels and things and we know that blood sugar irregularities can also affect endo and promote inflammation so win-win yeah. um, you know I'm not suggesting that everyone should be vegan by any means but I am suggesting that, you know, the load of animal products should potentially be reviewed, potentially minimised, but certainly organic so that she's not affecting her hormone cascades even more. Um, I do find that soy products aggravate, so discouraging soy, but more, you know, the soy that's added everywhere rather than the, you know, the traditional homemade tofu or something, um, but the soy lecithin and the soy flour and the soy oil and, you know, the, all the rubbish soy 
that can certainly wreak a lot of havoc. It does appear to be everywhere. I know I got sent through by a patient actually a Facebook link that was saying soy <laughs> basically it was horrific and then soy is, is toxic basically and I had to really similar to you yourself then tone that down into you know, I guess what soy is and it's more that it's overloaded particularly in vegan diets you get soy burgers soy sausages there's soy seems to be soy everything so yeah, yeah it, it's that sort of soy which seems to be more the issue than the soy that is naturally is and tofu yeah yeah no absolutely I think you know like if she can eliminate those sorts of foods straight away she tends to see a lot of benefit in her symptoms um, but another food group that is a little bit more complicated are foods that are high in amines. And amines are, you know, there is a substance that relates to protein degradation and it inflames the system by increasing histamine levels. And there's this lovely dance that occurs with women with endometriosis where high histamine levels perpetuate the bug proliferation, the infective and inflammatory response, which proliferates the estrogen, which proliferates the endo, and then the endo feeds the histamine. They just keep going round and round and round. So, you know, lowering her load of amine foods is actually very, very therapeutic. Amine foods, you know, your richest amine foods are certainly things that are fermented and aged. So, you know, get rid of the blue cheese and the, you know, the sauerkraut and the kimchi and all that sort of stuff. And straight away, she notices quite a significant improvement. Um, the severity of the endo will influence the extent of how much she needs to reduce or avoid. Mm -hmm. And certainly I don't think that everyone needs to cut everything out. Um, but it's the aged aspect of the food that's the biggest trigger. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, there's lots of foods that help. You know, I, I think the herb turmeric can never be underestimated. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the research around it and it's certainly about regulating blood coagulation and normalising VEGF levels, which are always abnormal in endo women, or normalising interleukins and um, inflammatory processes. It's so herb par excellence, you know, and if every woman with endo could have a heap teaspoon of organic turmeric every day in something with a fatty base, a lot of symptoms would go just from that. Yeah, it's great to see it used in food as well. I think that's really important that we can do so much for our food and even the herbs can be introduced um, into food. I know, I, yeah, I do that a lot as well. Mm. So I guess, well, I mean, we talked about inflammation. Mm. Um, are there any other herbs that you use or nutrients other than, than those, and particularly in relation to the the gut as well um i know that's involved in inflammation and the immune system but we want to reduce the kimchi and things which often people go oh great for prebiotics and that sort of thing how do you look at the gut and what is your gut protocol or treatment for, mm -hmm. for endometriosis and the inflammation well the first thing i need to do is discern if there's a parasite or a bacterial imbalance or something along those lines mm -hmm. so a, a fairly expensive stool test is usually in order um, unfortunately, because, you know, standard stool tests are not definitively accurate and they often don't test the microbiology appropriately. And then if I can cause some balance or rebalance to the bacterial colonies and, you know, support the proliferation of the healthy microbiota, then, you know, that has that beautiful ripple effect of improving absorption, nutritional status, um, improving gut integrity, normalising bowel transit time, and then it just continues and then you can start to change the microbiota in her uterus and kidneys and wherever. Um, but, you know, every woman with endo is aware of the symptom of constipation before her period and diarrhoea with her period. And, you know, that de definitively relates to her clearance of her estrogens and, you know, byproducts and inflammatory things. So if you can normalise that gut function and stabilise that, she tends to just ease the pain symptom just on its own, just from doing that. So a good stool analysis helps and then tailoring the treatment accordingly. In yeah. some instances, she might need a probiotic supplement. In some, she needs a, an antimicrobial herbal regime. In some, she needs antibiotics. It depends on what comes back. Yeah. And if you find the immune system is involved in endometriosis, um, what are your go-to treatments? I know there's a lot about echinacea at the moment and being the adaptogen as well. And, mm. and uh, what are your thoughts on using you know, herbal treatments and that for the immune system in regards to endometriosis? Mm. Um, I'm a little bit different with the herbal component of endo in the sense that I don't use alcoholic extracts in my endo women. Mm. I find that the alcohol um, content of the herbal medicines, as much as I love the herbs, but the alcohol content perpetuates the histamine reaction which aggravates the whole cycle. So then I look at it in the context of something that's encapsulated or powdered or whatever. You know, there are certain women's where I'll use traditional Chinese medicine formulas that are really fantastic at blood moving herbs because, you know, so much about endo is the stagnancy of the blood pooling, you know, and she then always gets her low iron levels, which lower her blood pressure, which cause more stagnancy, you know, and circulatory issues. But 
a woman that has that level of inflammation and immune involvement invariably has just those histamine cycles. So some of my more key therapeutic strategies would be to normalize her quercetin and, and to give her optimal quercetin levels in conjunction with um, seropeptidase or um, like biofilm agents and um, enzymes and different substances to just clean her blood and get her blood moving through her body more efficiently, which produces a, a systematic benefit, uh, like a, a holistic all body benefit reduction in headaches and migraines, as well as improving the blood that she loses in her menstrual period. Yes, yeah, so really it's purple, but not purple. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, no, you're right. Well, it's, it's great that we can merge the two, really, um, because it is a sex systemic condition and it does affect a lot of other things. You know, as you said, they often get constipation. There'll be IBS symptoms, which are, as you said, often diagnosed as, yeah, period pain and, and IBS. Yeah. Which in fact, they're actually all, all linked as symptoms. Mm. So I guess for women out there who uh, may be experiencing these sort of symptoms or may have a diagnosis of endometriosis and mm. are wanting to fall pregnant, you know, often it is, well, you have to go to IVF. There's, mm -hmm. what are the, for people listening, what are some of the basic things that they can do? Obviously, go and see your naturopath. As you can see, it's, it's the best thing to do to, to get, you know, personalised treatment. Yeah. But what are some of the dietary recommendations or things that people can start doing uh, to support their own fertility in this journey? Absolutely. Look, I think the foods that we talked about earlier about removing them from the diet and, you know, each woman giving herself an opportunity to have a good month to avoid those foods and see what the impact is. If she doesn't see that there's any change in her period at all, you know, consider looking at it differently. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, caffeine and alcohol and the basics that we know interfere with natural fertility are, are things to avoid. Um, pardon me, sorry. No, feel free. We've, we've got you talking a lot, so... <laughs> Sorry. Um, the thing, the only challenge with a woman doing that on her own is just that she needs to make sure that her diet is balanced. So you don't cut dairy out and then all of a sudden not have enough calcium. Yeah. So make sure that she's eating chickpeas and tahini and almonds and hazelnuts and, you know, all sorts of other sources. And if she's averse to eliminating dairy in its entirety, then at least eliminate a one form of milk um, or at least eliminate cow's dairy and only have goats or sheep's. An experiment with the different types or, or bufflers or whatever it might be experiment with the different types and see the impact that way um it's really important for women with endo to have a non-inflammatory diet though so you know not eating deep fried foods and not eating lots of packaged and processed foods and having a very whole food diet which we know is invariably positive for everybody but certainly for endo women it's you know take the load off your body you know make the food as easily digestible as possible so that you can get the nutrition from it and other strategies, obviously, be hydrated, you know, have blood moving support, have things like ginger and turmeric and chili and fresh herbs that move your blood through your body, have enough water, have enough salt in your diet, have enough seaweeds in your diet so that you have the ability to have blood that moves because that stagnancy component, you know, in Chinese medicine language, everything is cold, you know, because everything is so static and so stagnant that it pulls and it just causes inflammation. So the more it moves, the better it is. And, you know, you extend that into are you exercising? Are you moving? Are you doing anything with your body? Um, you know, the humble castor oil pack can never be underestimated. You know, I got an email from a patient this morning and she's like, oh, my God, I'm blown away. And all women are, and, you know, for listeners that aren't aware of it, castor oil pack is literally castor oil organic. It has to be so that it doesn't have toxins in it. Um, on, you know, just a cloth, a muslin, something applied to your belly with a hot water pack or a wheat pack on top and just lie there and meditate for a bit. And the heat and the penetration of that castor oil into your belly just helps to move the blood, to break down adhesions, to break down stagnancy in the blood and clots and things. And generally when women use castor oil packs, not when they're actively bleeding, but through the cycle, you know, maybe a couple of times a week, there's such a dramatic difference in their menstrual flow. You know, it goes from being dark and clotted and really painful to being bright red and clear flowing and much easier and much lighter. There's something in that, you know, you're moving the blood that, that has to be acknowledged. Um, I think that's important to know too. The, the menstrual flow is not like, I mean, as naturopaths, we get to compare lots of different mm. menstrual flow and we know a lot about it, but, you know, the, the average person doesn't compare menstrual flow. So, to, you know, what what is... What are you looking for when you're looking for ideal menstrual flow? What should women be looking for? Well, first and foremost, no pain. Yes. <laughs> you know, no pain. Uh, a healthy period is not one where we have significant symptoms in the lead-up or during. 
it's something that we're aware that, okay, maybe we don't want to run on the beach like a, a television ad, but perhaps we want to actually just, you know, we want to um, be more introspective and we want to have our blood flow through our body. That's totally reasonable. But something that interferes with your quality of your life is abnormal. So it should be that it starts bright red and that the flow is very easy. It's not too viscous or thick. There's no clots in it and it just passes. And, you know, when you look at the literature, a woman should only be losing somewhere between 80 and 90 mils of blood per menstrual period. Mm -hmm. That's three shot glasses of alcohol. Women mainly are losing somewhere around 500 mils per period. Mm -hmm. You know, with my endo women, sometimes I get them to actually quantify the volume that they're losing based on, you know, this tampon or this pad should, you know, absorb this much. And it's mind-blowing for them. When you think about how much blood is actually circulating in your body at any given moment, that's a significant percentage. So it's about the awareness of, no, you shouldn't be flooding through the bed yeah. and you shouldn't be having to change your pad or tampon every half an hour. That's not normal. Yeah. yeah. And you need to do something about it. And the first thing that you obviously have to look at is, are you anemic? Because when our iron is low, we don't clean out our uterus very well. So our circulating blood goes into our uterus to shed all that lining that's built up. And when our, our um, iron is very low, our blood pressure is very low, so it goes in and it trickles and you just have this constant flow of bleeding. So that's not normal. So get your iron levels checked first because that will reduce the heaviness of the flow. Um, and then is there something else in there like endo? And then you need to work out what you need to do to fix that. Yeah, because that's depleting in itself. Having that, that heavy loss, you know, horrible. every is, is horrible. despite any other symptoms. Yeah, horrible. You're just basically, you know, you're, you're putting someone further down that's already quite flat. Yes, yeah, exactly. So I guess, I mean, that you obviously covered most of the points about, um, you know, what women can do. Is there anything you would like to end on to, to let people know that, you know, uh, what they should be doing? I mean, hydration, I think, obviously, you've mentioned is number one. You know, the dairy um, is so important and you can notice symptom relief relatively soon uh, after doing those. And the inflammatory diet, I'll just get you to touch a little bit more on the anti-inflammatory diet. I know I use that a lot. Um, what sort of foods can they use? you know, whole foods, what should a diet look like, an average diet look like when they're, you know, focusing on the inflammation? Um, an anti-inflammatory diet is something that, you know, the foods are as close to natural as possible yeah. um, and the known triggers for that person are avoided. So the main triggers we've covered, you know, soy, dairy, gluten, what have you. Um, caffeine is a big one for some people. Um, but for me, it, it tends to be that aiming food group. They're the most inflammatory foods for people. So, you know, the difference between eating... Um, you know, food with MSG, that's probably your quickest diagnostic of an amine because it is an amine substance. You know, so if someone has, for example, a potato chip with MSG versus a plain potato chip, they will have a significant reaction that's very, very different. Not that the potato chip is so healthy, but it's just a quick example. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, it's the same thing as a woman that has goat's cheese versus yellow um, hard cheese. The amine content of the yellow hard cheese is so much greater because it's fermented and it's aged versus the goat's cheese. And straight away she knows that there's a difference there. So when you think about like a low amine diet, it's everything needs to be fresh, no leftovers, nothing too old, nothing that has gone through any aging process. And straight away everything's different. So little tweaks, you know, the humble muesli and um, milk and yogurt and berries and whatever for breakfast, you have the untoasted muesli because then the muesli is not aged. You don't have the dried fruit because the dried fruit is aged, you have fresh fruit. You maybe don't have the cow's milk, you have almond milk. Just little tweaks like that and then straight away that meal is completely different and she doesn't have any reactivity. Yeah. So it's, 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 they're not actually very difficult changes. It's just often helpful to have someone to guide you through it, but it's certainly things that people can work out on their own. When you look at your meal, how old is it, when was it last in the ground or when was it last connected to the animal or whatever it might be and how can you make it fresher and straight away you lower the amine content. And improve your diet in general, which is yes. something I'm always asking patients, know the history of your food. Where did it come from? Because a lot of the time we don't know. You know, it's shipped, thawed, frozen, lands on our supermarket shelves in a packet, you know, and how long has that been? That process been, yeah. you know, up to 12 months I've heard for some foods, which is pretty scary to get on our shelves. So well, I might put some of those tips up on the website, mm -hmm. uh, particularly those amine food, because I know that might be uh, quite a new one for some people listening who may not be aware of the, the amine foods. Mm -hmm. So 
Thank you so much for joining us today, Leah. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. As, as I've said, I've attended your presentations and I think nearly every naturopath has one of your textbooks on her shelf. Uh, so it's fabulous that you were able to join us today and give us your amazing wisdom on this topic which affects so many women, you're one in 10 Australian women. So hopefully we can help uh, some of those. Thank you for having me. So thanks for joining us today. I really hope uh, you enjoyed uh, hearing about Leia's insights into endometriosis and whether you're treating patients or yourself, uh, we've given you a bit of insight into how to improve your symptoms, improve your fertility and to improve your reproductive outcomes to help you get pregnant. So hopefully you're already part of the Conceived Baby community. Um, you can always jump over to the Facebook page and join the discussion. I often base a lot of the webinars that I do on what you want to know. So we've talked about endometriosis today, but feel free to join the discussion over in the group. Send me an email through tashajennings.com um, or just re um, yep, jump on Facebook and let us know what you're currently struggling with, what you would like more information on and how we can best help you. Thanks for joining us.